welcome to episode six of Late Night Sleep Radio. You see, I changed the name from Late Night Talk Radio because actually I thought that uh, it might be confused with other kinds of radio. And in fact, it doesn't go out on the radio. I, I, I did um, flirt with a radio station, but you know, it's a lot of work running a late radio station, especially one that runs 24 hours. You just wouldn't get any sleep. And I'm not sure I could sustain it for very long. I'm kind of joking there. But no, you can do. I mean, you can put, um, it, these days you can, if it's a music uh, station, you can program um, songs to go on all night uh, on playlists. You, you can do it a bit with, I mean, I've got a lot of stories recorded now. I've got hours and hours and hours of stories, so I could potentially do it. But you have to pay for it, and it's not very clear why one would do it. I'm not sure that radio, which is a great pity, and this would be internet radio, of course, so you have to listen to it on the radio anyway. So I'm not sure it's any advantage over a podcast, by the by. So it's night again. Funny how that always happens, until I suppose the day it doesn't. And as Epicurus said, um, when, when he didn't say this, he basically said to boil it down, uh, yeah, so what? You won't know. Just enjoy yourself. And I think that's good advice, really, even in the middle of the night, even when you're lying there. I have a lot of my patients who don't sleep very well, and um, there are a number of reasons for that which we won't go into. Some of them drink lots of energy drinks. That's probably a big mistake. Or take, take cane again. I think that isn't... I've never taken cocaine, but um, I, I, I believe it isn't good at getting you to sleep. Anyway, we're going to shortly head over to um, custom of the day. But I... Funnily enough, last week I was talking about our walk on the Ridgeway, wasn't I? That long distance um, path that goes across from basically Wiltshire to Hertfordshire. Yeah, Buckinghamshire, Hertfordshire. It goes through Buckinghamshire, certainly. You just touch in Hertfordshire at Tring and then you come out again and when you finish at the end of it. And I told you how I, I took that stone and I gave to those blokes. And then, funnily enough, Sheila showed me some footage of the... And they were going to walk back. The whole, They were starting off walking the other way from us. They were going to walk to Avebury and be there in time for the solstice. I remember saying this because I forgot about the solstice. But I wonder where my little stone is now. Anyway, this is sort of related because um, I... Um, some years ago, I was driving to work and I used to listen to a lot of podcasts. Still do. I tend to listen to more YouTube things these days, although my friend Steve yesterday has pointed me in the way of a podcast only, so I may well check that out. I'm driving down tonight, so I may listen to that uh, later on, because um, I've got to be there for the morning. But anyway, that's, you need to know about that so it's for, for work, really. But um, anyway, a podcast, there's all sorts of podcasts. Well, there is a thing called the Druid Cast. I don't know if you know Druid, Druid, you may know of Druidcast. It's a really nice podcast. Um, and some, some are better than others. There was a whole series of them that were, um, maybe I was listening a lot in COVID, and there were recordings of lectures people had given because it's the, the podcast of the Druids, of the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids. You may or may not know there are several Druidic orders. And I'm not sure... They don't appear to be daggers drawn. Um, be golden daggers, wouldn't it, or, or something? Of course, in D and D, druids can't use metal, so in that case, they have to be wood. Um, anyway, so uh, so Dave is the host. He's a good host, and his name is spelled D A M H, which is of course the, the the Gaelic, both Irish and Scottish way of spelling that. And I believe Dave Dav, written like that, is a Sturk. Or a male cow. That, yeah, that's a logical impossibility. A, a member of the cattle family who was a male. You've got to be very specific these days. I was walking past um, some new houses that are being built in Carlisle, in fact, and uh, in the middle of Portland Square, which is an old Victorian square, very grand, modelled on those that you find in London and in Edinburgh, but those London squares that have your big, big, big houses all round, um, and they have a shared communal garden in the middle and it uh it, it that it had been owned those buildings had been owned by the local authority of the county council and i remember going in 
to the social services there when I, you know, I had occasion through work to go in, and they'd made such a mess of these beautiful old houses, putting awful partitions in all run down. Anyway, somebody, which I approve of really, has um, bought them, a developer, and they're doing them, they're cleaning them, they're making them look really nice, by the by, no complaints about that. My complaint was, in fact, that there was a banner, and it said, I won't say the name of the company, because generally I think they're doing a good job, really. Uh, we can talk about houses, wealth. I'm not going to. Um, houses, nice houses for wealthy people, but um, the truth of it is, what do you think about that? And I'm not one of those wealthy people living in a, a nice house. But the truth is that um, it, it's money that allows these nice houses. And if everybody was poor like me, I mean, I'm not poor, poor. Not, you know, I'm not at all. I have been poor, but I'm not now. Um, I'm not rich either. But anyway, again, to the point was there was a banner outside which said exclusive houses I'll say that again exclusive houses for everybody and i thought mm, this kind of thing tickles me it's one of the few things i post on facebook the last one was a sign in keswick that said um warning this gate may be locked without prior warning i'm like well you just gave me prior warning in your sign and this is exclusive houses for everybody. You can't have that. So anyway, how I got to there for that, because I was talking about the Druids, wasn't I? And D&D &D Druids, I can't use metal. Um, but Druid podcast, it was good. Oh, yeah, anyway, let's not even try to get to crawl up that mountain to find the associations. Let's just go forward and be happy about it. And remember, we lose everything. We should have a zen attitude to that including our threads so i've just lost them the danger is that this podcast could get completely out of control so let's go back and talk about what i was going to talk about so particularly one time i was listening to the druid cast podcast with dave the bard and i was driving along and uh, he had a, a guy on called guy hayward i think that's how you pronounce it and and he basically set up a thing called the british pilgrimage trust and it is resurrecting. And I think the point that he was making was that he'd ended up doing a long distance walk. And our ancestors walked uh, most places. And you have a different relationship with the land. Um, I told you about when I, before I went on my uh, Ridgeway walk, I got into a, a book called The Long Walk to Glastonbury by a guy called Stuart Harding. I'll put a link to that as well. So he, again, he says, and I'm, I've talked about this book elsewhere. It's a good book. Um, he says that, uh, you know, you think the land's small when you go, when you drive fast on a motorway. But when you walk it, you realise it's really big. Places are big. And you have a more intimate um, relationship with nature. It, when it's raining and windy, that really matters. Or when it's sunny, that matters. All these things matter still. And where you're going to get food and water from matter. And the fact your feet hurt matters. So it's a, it is, you know, I'm very much in favour of it. And I put this down to listening to Guy Haywood um, and inspiring me to do walking. And I've read a lot of books about walking since. And, and he basically said, you know, he'd had this experience of walking. A friend had invited him to do it and realised that we don't do that. And he'd gone on to set off up this um, British Pilgrimage Trust. It's a charity. Now... And there's a book he's done called Britain's, Britain's Pilgrim Places. And the point is, you know, these are, you could argue potentially, I mean, you certainly the Ridgeway predates Christianity, but uh, uh, the Pilgrim are, in fact, nearly completely Christian, um, as befits a country that has been Christian for since 300 and odd, you know, so we're getting, you know, a long time. But it isn't. Uh, if you if you want to walk, you don't have to have any particular religious belief to do these and these um, pilgrimages. And they've made some attempt to kind of link older sacred sites as well. So they produced this big book called lovely book, lots of colours, colours. Yes, of course it has because it's got lots of pictures, and uh, it's got all these long, 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 long. And the first one you come to, and I'm like, funnily enough. I was talking to Sheila and we were walking on the walk. And we, it was a particular day. We'd walked a long way and we were tired and we were hot. And we had to walk away to get some food and shelter in a, in a pub. 
uh, off the Ridgeway. And uh, I said to her, would you do this again? Because the reason we did the Ridgeway was she had a hankering to do El Camino in north of Spain, which is like 400 miles goes to the Pyrenees. And I'm like, well, um, what a, you know, let's do this first. This is 100-ish. By the time we did it, it was 100. I think it's officially 80-something. Uh, and I said, well, would you do it again? And she was like, oh, no, 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 no. I said, I bet you in two weeks' time we get back. You start to think, you're starting to think about doing another one. And lo and behold, I must be psychic or something because this cropped up the other day. Anyway, going back to Britain's Pilgrim Places by Nick Mayhew Smith and Guy Hayward with an introduction by Simon Jenkins. Lovely big book. It's a very big book. You could kill a man with it. Um, which I don't, I'm not in, in any way endorsing. You've got to be careful when you go on out into the internet world that you say something and people take it completely maliciously and deliberately out of context. Um, not me. I've never had that happen to me, to be fair. But uh, I, I do see it with people and people say something and, and everybody jumps on them and you're like, you're like they, they didn't mean that in the way you're reported, particularly politicians who are twisters by nature, I suppose, narcissist twisters. I mean, I'm not saying there aren't any good ones. I mean, there, there, there must be statistically. Anyway, but pilgrims, you can't dislike a pilgrim, I don't think. Somebody was made that um, decision to go and walk and do all of the things I said and take a long time to do it is a, is a commitment. And funnily enough, when we went on our ridgeway, we were picked up by um, a, a Pakistani guy who was a uh, taxi driver. And he, as a young man, had gone to Iraq and done one of the big Shia pilgrimage routes. So we were, we were on, on a wavelength there. And, okay... So, the old way is the first one you come across. And it's like, um, it's, it's 250 miles, and you walk along the south coast from Southampton to Canterbury, and it takes you three weeks. Now, there's certain parts of that I would like to do. I probably wouldn't do the whole thing. I'd like to do the Chichester bit and the Lewis bit, and um, I've, I really want to go to Staining, because um, Victor Neuberg lived there, and he was the... Amanuensis of Alistair Crowley. There's lots of kind of magic y stuff there. And there's um, Clapton, Clapton Wood, which is supposed to be massively haunted. And then there's Chanctonbury Ring, where people levitate. So there's all that kind of thing there. I'd like to do that. Brighton, I'd like to, I haven't been to Brighton for years since I lived in London, which was much easier to get to from there. And, um, you know, and Sheila's never been to Brighton. I said, oh, you must go to Brighton. And then we, and then ultimately the end, of course, Canterbury. I haven't been to Canterbury for many years. And the whole bit of, I would take a diversion to do Winchelsea and Rye and those lovely, lovely um, uh, East Sussex, Kent towns on, on the villages and towns on the border. Anyway, let me, let me tell you what it says the old way. Rediscovered by William Parsons from the 1360 Goff, Goff map. Old Way is being re-established by the British Pilgrimage Trust. Isn't that a great thing to do? This beautiful route linked European and British pilgrims alike who sought Thomas Becket's shrine. Remember Thomas Becket being murdered, became a, a, a saint and a martyr. Oh, he was a martyr. And a, a big pilgrimage dude. Not that he did, when I say that, not he did, may have done. But what I mean is um, he attracted pilgrims, but only when he was dead. And you, you could talk about whether he whether that was what he intended. Oh, yeah, anyway, let's not get too ridiculous. You start at the busy double tied port of Southampton. I didn't know Southampton was a double tied port. I don't think I, I've been to Southampton, but mm -hmm. before heading lo heading along the dramatic Solent shoreline, crossing the River Hamble in a tiny pink ferry, resting in the Golden Lion pub where D Day was planned past the St. Thomas of Eckert Church in Warblington, along the Solent Way and coastal channels to St. Richard's Shrine at Chichester Cathedral. I remember Chichester being a really lovely place. Then traverse wooded downland to Arundel. Arundel's lovely. It used to go there as well, with its great castle and panoramic views. Continue along the glorious South Downs via a medieval pilgrim hostel at Bramber, Bramber or Bramber, and let the sacred springs of Folking revitalise you. Savour the soaring heights of Ditchling Beacon before reaching Lewis with its 11th century priory, the first Cluniac house in England. Then experience the awesome silence at Bible Bottom Valley before climbing to panoramic Mount Caburn and descending through 
Bloomsbury sat country around Furl with Berwick's brightly painted church. Leaving the downs since the 5th century Wilmington yew tree before, I don't know what that means there, sense it, before the low ret, I'm going to start again, before the low wet grasslands of the Pevensey levels until battle where the Norman conquest was sealed. Dramatic coastal landscapes as you pass through picture picturesque Winchelsea and Rye before turning inland along the historically defensive River Rother into Kent. You traverse the remote Romney marshes to Saltwood Castle, from where the knights who killed Thomas of Eckert made their final journey. Next, along the quintessential Elm Valley Way to refresh at St. Ethelburga's Well, Liming or Liming before coming to the ever-popular Pilgrim Church of Patrick's Bourne. An unforgettable arrival at Canterbury, first from Mount Joy and then on entering the city walls with its extraordinary medieval ecclesiastical grandeur, an ultimate destination for British pilgrimage. I'm going to try and sell that to Sheila. If she won't come, then yeah, I don't know if you, any of you fancy doing it, it would take three weeks. It's not cheap, actually, because, um, well, if you camp, it's cheaper, but then you've got to carry your tent and your food and, and your burners and, and everything and your sleeping bags and everything. So, you know, people do a B&B, don't they? Uh, and actually um, planning that B&B because you have to divert usually off your route. I'm now giving you the practical problems of it, which I didn't mean to do because it sounded great. That didn't. I'm sold. But, you know, three weeks walking, it's, it is, it's a thing. It's not a nothing. So, um, anyway, sounds great. I hope my enthusiasm didn't wake you up there. We need really now to get to uh, Steve Roud's book, uh, The English Year, which is the for custom of the day. I feel a diversion, a digression coming on before I get to Steve Roud's book, The English Year. And it's just to explain about my links, my links. Don't often hear that, do you? And somebody comes up to you and goes, oh, I just need to explain about my links. But I, I always feel the need to tell a story in full detail, none of this skimping. So basically, um, I thought, oh, I'll tell you what, Tom, because that's how I talk to myself. Um, I, I, you could, you could, I'll tell you what you could do. You could make some affiliate money. I went, oh, yeah. So in the past, I've done this by linking to Amazon. Amazon's been all right with me, you know, they pay me for my books and things, so I've got no complaints, but I, you know, blah, 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 let's have an argument with Amazon, it's too late, isn't it, to do that, but some people don't, so I thought, I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll try and look for an alternative, there's a thing called bookshop.org, and it supports indie bookshops, and you know me, I love an indie bookshop, I love bookshops, and I spend a lot of time in bookshops, and I buy books from bookshops, and the indie ones are the best. Uh, they're the worst as well, uh, and the best depends which one you walk in. And that's the whole point, isn't it? You walk into a, a chain bookshop, of which there are not many really, just Waterstones now. No complaints with Waterstones. They're always good to me. But, um, you know, with indie, there was that one in Hawes in, in North Yorkshire. I was there. Sheila's going on Saturday as well, but I don't know if I'll go because uh, I might go and take the dogs for nice walks around there. But anyway... So uh, this it's shut now because the guy was too rude. He didn't really like people buying his books. It were his books, and they came in with their and they would left the door open, and, oh, and they and they didn't know anything about books. So anyway, indie bookshops in general a good thing. We shall agree. So this this thing called um, Bookshop.org, and there is a, a UK and an American version, but they're separate. So I've only got an account with the UK one. Um, which isn't necessarily, you know, if anybody from America wants to buy these books, have a look at book, bookshop.org, the um, US version. But I have put links because I've got this account with um, Indie Bookshop. So basically, if you click on that link, I get some money and the Indie Bookshop gets some money and you get a book. So um, I, the, I'm going to, in the show notes, I've put this on my website. So, so anyway, the widgets they do are really nice. They have a nice big picture of the book's cover and they say something about it. And it, it's always discounted, in one case, by 40 pence. Yeah, most cases by 40 pence. But it's better than not being discounted by 40 pence. Let's, let's face it. The only one I can't do that is a long walk to Glastonbury. And that's probably because he's published it just through Amazon. It's not available um, through the um, big, big publishers. We say that in the same way we say Big Pharma. What's the other one? 
big. There's various big things and it's bad. If it's big, it's bad. Anyway, that is a link. Let's get back to customer of the day. It's been a long time coming this week, but I think it's, it's getting near time anyway. It is today, the 12th of July, 2023. Not that that makes a difference because as soon as I've said that, it's no longer um, 12.55 or whatever time. Oh, yeah. Anyway, work it out. So let's talk about the first Saturday in July and we'll talk about Ambleside rush bearing. So Ambleside's not too far from me. I go to Grassmere every week um, and Ambleside's just a bit further. Ambleside's actually, I probably prefer Ambleside to Keswick. Oh, don't get upset, you Keswick people, of the three of you who are listening. Of the five places in Cumbria that have existing rush bearing ceremony, so rush being like a bull rush or a kind of piece of grass that grows in a bog or a marsh. Yeah. Um, there are a number of little villages in the central Lake District that do this Grassmere rush bearing. It's not the same date. They do their Grassmere on the 5th of August. Ambleside is the biggest deal. As elsewhere at Ambleside, first Saturday in July, the main part of the celebration is a procession with band banners and villagers carrying rushes, flowers and burdens of rushes, they call them burdens, made into symbolic shapes. They parade around the village and up to the church, lovely old church, um, St Oswald, uh, claims, uh, claimed to mean from 654 or something, so it's old, old, old. There's not anything standing from those dates. I think the date is probably, it's, it's quite old though, you know, it's probably a thousand years old. Um, they par- not 1500. They par- parade around the village and up to the church where a special service takes place and those taking part are traditionally rewarded with gingerbread because of course Grassmere is famous for its Grassmere gingerbread. At any time of the year you will find a queue outside the Grassmere gingerbread shop every time I go. The only time that wasn't true was when I was there um, in um, lockdown. It was an unlockdown lockdown. So there'd been a lockdown, but it was still lockdown-ish. Although they said, you can go a little way. And I said, well, you know, it's not that far from me, so I'm going for a walk. And there was nobody about. Everybody in Grasmere obeyed lockdown. I was living in, I was living and working in West Cumbria, so I was living in Maryport at the time, which is um, a completely socially different place. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's, it's got a lot of deprivation. It's, there's no real middle class as such. In Maryport, oh, the three middle class people in Maryport are now complaining. But um, whereas Grassmere, because it's so pretty, it's all pretty, um, has is is you you can't live there unless you're wealthy. So um, the, so they didn't they obeyed uh, lockdown, whereas the the West Cumbrians didn't obey it so much. Anyway, let's get back to rush bearing. For many years. The ceremony was held on the Saturday nearest St Anne's Day, 26th of July, as the present St Mary's Church, I'm sure it's St Oswald's, you know, replaced one dedicated to St Anne, but is now held on the first Saturday in July. That's made me perplexed because it, it, it actually there's a plaque outside the church that says about, oh yeah, Oswald preached here um, bef- when he was one, he was a king of Northumbria. He conquered Cumbria and obviously he did a bit of preaching to... Um, to the natives, uh, and yes, yeah, so now they're saying St Mary's, so there is a mismatch here, either in my memory or there's something going on. You know what you do these days? You just Google it, wouldn't you? That's what you, we, even when we were walking, we go, "What's that flower?" Google it. We'd have a Sheila and I disagree a lot about <laughs> about like loads of things, and uh, we have Google wars, and I, I can't claim always to be right, although I feel I'm right, which uh, and feelings are more important than facts, as we know. So I feel I'm right, even when I'm factually wrong. Um, Google was. So I'm not going to Google war it because I'm talking to you and it would be impolite. Anyway, nowadays the bearings or burdens are mostly made from natural flowers and rushes, but for a time in the past they were primarily made of wood covered in coloured paper. Margaret Nicholson, whose parents ran the local post office in the mid-19th century, wrote down her memories of the burdens of 1898, and extracts were included in the 1953 booklet on rush-bearing by E.F. Rawnsley. He was a big man with the National Trust, you know. He was a reverend. The burdens, spelt with a T-H, burdens. I think there's a, there's a linguistic thing goes on with R and D when it, you see this in place names. It becomes like, not rd, but rd. So it softens the D into, into a th, almost a th. Anyway, where devices of in every imaginable shape made by the carpenter for the great ladies and by the skillful-handed ones at home 
during the winter months, covered with coloured papers and coloured flowers. Sounds nice. Yards of tissue paper must have been used, or tissue paper must have been used. Aye, we know about that. For we had to lay in a stock of blue and pink and yellow. Mr. Harrison of scale allowed us ten shilling to give away to the poor folk in sheets of tissue each year, or as they would send out each ear, and we used to cut it into frills for them, for the mecking of rosettes and flowers. There we are. I thought you'd appreciate that. Margaret's mother was in charge of making the collection to cover the cost of the gingerbread. Important. And once they got refined enough to replace the traditional fiddler with a proper band for them too, the rush-bearing ceremony of half a century ago is depicted in a mural 26 feet long, created by Gordon Ransom in 1944, which can be seen in St Mary's. Well, Steve Roud knows a lot of stuff, and if he says that it's St Mary's, then I'm, kind of to, I'm going to have to go and check next Monday. I'm not going to Google it, though. Anyway, let me say a bit more about rush bearing, because if you aren't familiar with this, I could understand your perplexity. The rush bearing. Until 200 years ago, rushes strewn on the floors of buildings for warmth and comfort would have been a common enough sight in many rural areas. And before that, in urban settings too. Floor rushes were used extensively in domestic settings, from cottage to royal palace, although there were vast differences in how they were treated. At the upper levels of society, the rushes were changed frequently, and herbs and flowers were mixed with them to keep them sweet. But at the lower end, new rushes were simply thrown on top of the fetid mess that had become of the previous ones. In the better houses, it was also the custom to honour the guests by putting down new rushes. Is the summer ready, the house trimmed, rushes strewed, cobwebs swept? asks Grumio in Act in Act. See, I was trying to be too posh there. In Act, in Act Four of Scene One of Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew, and many other dramatists and poets of the time have referred to the practice. Queen Elizabeth I was probably the last monarch to have her places regularly strewn with rushes, but in other circles, rush floors could still be found in some areas in the 19th century. Churches were also regularly strewn with rushes. One of my favourite words, strewn, strew, strewn. I'll just strew that there, Sheila. I'll strew down the dog food. In early modern times, there were no pews and the congregation stood or knelt on the floor for the whole service. In unheated churches, didn't know that, did you? In unheated churches with earth or stone floors, this could be a serious trial and a layer of rushes could make all the difference. Provision of rushes was normally the responsibility of the church wardens, and they were chargeable to the parish, so payments appear regularly in early parish accounts. It was quite common also for devout parishioners to bequeath money to pay for the rushes, or to leave parcels of land from which the rushes could be cut annually. As churches gradually acquired decent floors, rushes became superfluous, and in most cases simply faded from the local scene but the speed at which these changes took place varied widely from parish to parish. In Lancashire alone, for example, Kirkham Church was flagged in 1634, but Saddleworth was not paved until 1826, and the floor of Pilling Church was covered in rushes until about 1868. By the 19th century, however, rushes on church floors were seen by many as decidedly unhygienic and unbelievably antiquated. As so often happens with church-based events, the annual rush strewing took on a celeb hard to say. The annual rush strewing took on a celebratory aspect, giving a devotional spin to a practical occasion and bringing the rushes to the church or rush bearing became a major festival in which the whole community could join. Again, there was a wide variety within the custom, but two relatively distinct ways of rush bearing developed. In Cheshire and Lancashire, the rushes were brought with much celebration on highly decorated carts during village wakes, accompanied by drummers, musicians and Morris dancers, as in the following memory from Lancashire in the 1830s. I remember going to stay at Radcliffe to see the rush bearing. We stood out of doors to watch the procession coming up the road. The Morris dancers came along dancing, both men and women, and I think there was a clown. They were decked up with ribbons and things. The men had ribbons flying from their caps or hats and their shoulders. A cart, or I think it was a wagon, came after them. On the driving seat, as I may call it, sat a man and a woman, Robin Hood and Maid Marian, in a green bower arching over their heads. 
Behind and above this was a tall erection with straight sides and a pointed gable-ended top, all made of rushes, and against the flat front of it were hung large silver spoons and tankards, shining. I bet somebody puts a comment about that. Some little snigger. These rush cart celebrations had taken shape by at least the 1720s and had a carnival atmosphere, but in other places the normal rush-bearing festival was a more controlled and dignified religious procession in which women and children took a prominent part, carrying flowers, token rushes and symbolic devices in, in various shapes such as crosses, harps and crowns. It is this method of rush-bearing that has survived at places like Grasmere in Cumbria, this form of celebration is probably nearer to the original than the noisy extrovert festivities of the rush carts. And James First's Book of Sports, 1618, I've got no link to that one, for example, which laid out the sports that were permissible on Sundays, see page 354. This is Steve Rowd saying this, I haven't got, not got a page 354 in this podcast. Specifically names rush carrying as a female custom. And that women shall have leave to carry rushes to the church for the de decoring of it according to their old custom. Similarly, a description of Grasme in the 18th century. About the latter end of September, a number of young women and girls, generally the whole parish, go together to the tops of the hills to gather rushes. These they carry to the church, headed by one of the smartest girls in the company. She who leads the procession is styled the Queen, and carries in her hand a large garland, and the rest equally, usually, have nosegays, the Queen then goes and places a garland upon the pulpit where it remains till after next Sunday. The rest then strew, favourite word again, their rushes upon the bottom of the pews. And at the church door, they are met by a fiddler who plays before them to the public house. I knew it would end up in a pub, where the evening is spent with all kinds of rustic merriment. It's well known that rustic merriment is the best kind of merriment. I'm now thinking about that. Maybe, maybe not. This evidence also demonstrates that it is somewhat simplistic to believe that the routine practice of replacing the rushes on a church floor suddenly became a symbolic ritual once the practical necessity had disappeared. It, came, it is clear that the rush bearing had taken on a range of festival trappings at many churches long before their new flooring made them obsolete. At Grasmere again, where the floor was paved in 1840, a visitor noted in 1818... Every part of the church crammed with all sorts of tawdry and ridiculous things stuck upon sticks, hoops and crosses and made to stand upright. These sticks were covered with coloured paper, red, green and yellow flowers of all sorts. Well, he doesn't approve of it. He's probably from the town. Some further questions still remain, such as why the major rush cart festival developed in such a restricted area and indeed how the transformation from practical to festive actually took place. Some have assumed that the change was planned by the church authorities, as in an article in Country Home magazine in June 1909. I've got a copy of that. That's not true, I just say these things. In their wisdom, clergymen and church wardens turned a matter of necessity into a religious festival and thus won the interest and cooperation of the laity, which likes to have a prosaic duty glorified into something higher and more attractive. But... In her analysis of Rush Carts and Wakes, published in, in 1982, Teresa Buckland rightly stresses the community's involvement in the rush-bearing celebrations. The collection of money from the local gentry, the loan of silver items to decorate the cart, and the hours spent embroidering sheets, sewing on ribbons, and constructing bearings to carry, and implies that this was a relatively secularised custom that had been grafted onto a religious base. I feel, I feel a digression coming, I'm going to... Hold it back. Children's rush-bearing processions survive at five Cumbrian villages and the rush carts have been revived in recent years at several places, including Saddleworth and Salby Bridge, which are in Yorkshire. Is Saddleworth in Lancashire? They're very close, anyway. Mm, there you go. There you go. Oh, my digression was related to something that me and Sheila were talking about when we were walking down the avenue of Standing Stones at Avebury. You know, Sheila is a kind of psychic, and she was talking about how she was picking up all this um, festivity and uh, stuff. And when we saw the YouTube video of the uh, the modern this year's um, uh, solstice, it is it is a festive thing. And when I've been up to Castlerig, which is another stone circle near me here, uh, and at uh, Midsummer, and there's lots of kind of carrying on people on tents, playing the spoons. Literally, somebody's playing the spoons, drinking. I'm afraid. 
and carrying on. And I think um, in many cases, and, and you know, many religious festivals were also occasions going back for the community to have a good time and play music and dance and people to meet each other and have a drink and possibly have a fight because uh, that seems to be what people like to do, both those things. And kiss, apparently, they do that. So the kiss... Sometimes it's the same person doing all these things, drinking, kissing, fighting. The order can vary. You can have the kissing, then the drinking, then the fighting. You can have the fighting, then the kissing, then the drinking. You know, I mean, there's, there's, my mathematics tells me there's nine ways you can do that. Now I'm going to, I'm, I'm now, oh no, is that true? If you've just made a mathematical error and everybody's going to think you're an, uh, not an illiterate, but a, um, in, uh, what's it, discalculus. Discalculus, I've got that. I've got um, I've got a bit of dyspraxia, um, but I'm, I've definitely got dyscalculia. I you can't I can't do numbers much, apart from my wages. I'm now I'm going to turn to another book because I like books, uh, and uh, this is called England in particular. It's another big heavy book that you could kill a man with. Again, don't take that as an endorsement of murder. Um, Funnily enough, I, yeah, I digress. You know, at work, I have I'm a psychiatric nurse, and so I have people phoning up for drugs, and some of them like they want like opiates and benzodiazepines and things. I'm going, I'm not giving you them, and they go. And one of the things they always say is, um, mm, "I could get them. I could get them uh, on the dark web." You know, I go, "Okay." Are you telling me to break the law? I go, no. <laughs> but And then at least one honest lad said to me, he said he wanted me to give him some Valium. I said, I'm not doing it. He says, I, s I can get it in the dark web. I says, oh, all right. Well, he says, but to be honest with you, it's cheaper if you give me it. Because, of course, for, for lots of people in, in the UK, their prescriptions are free, so they get their medications free. So why would you buy your drugs off a dealer when you can get higher quality, you know what it is, uh, and you can give for nothing? It makes perfect sense. Anyway, I still said I wasn't going to do them. And then he offered me, he said, I'll split it with you because he was actually wanting to sell it. Um, a very honest man, despite the amount of time he spent in prison. I think he's in prison again now. Uh, you wouldn't, he was always okay with me, but you just wouldn't want to meet him on the dark night because he was, um, he was extremely violent as well. And his brother was, his brother was doing eight years for, and he'd just come out. So, but charming, char lots, very charming and honest. And that is a great virtue. So he wasn't totally lost. Honesty is a great thing. Anyway, um, I have a bit of a problem with, like, you know, they go, oh, you want me to... I buy a lot of books, and Sheila will go, well, you buy another book then? I go, yeah, but, you know, I, 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 I need it for the podcast. It's good, isn't it? This one, England in particular, edited by Sue Clifford and Angela King, put out by Common Ground, which is an organisation... I have a, a tremendous amount of time for, and I have had since the 90s, when the early 90s when I came across them. It's like a, an encyclopedia, just a, a whimsical collection about various things. Uh, and I notice, I've put a link to it on my links page, and I noticed that it's 119, 119 pounds and 90 pence. I didn't pay that. I got it off eBay, secondhand, cheap. Um, actually, really cheap. Really, I probably paid about 250 for it. But... Um, £119. That's for a new copy. I think it must be rarer than hen's teeth now. I'm going to read you this because I just opened it at random. And so there's... My eye was caught by earthquakes. And I thought, yeah, I could, yeah, I could do something about earthquakes. And then I, I looked slightly left and I saw earth pigments. Now that has to... That is more curious, isn't it? Earth pigments. What even does that mean? So let us see. Okay, this is earth pigments from England in particular. Um... Colour has always enlivened our surroundings and been put to ritual or workaday uses from the vegetable bases of weld and woad. I don't know what weld is. I know what woad is, it's a plant. To animal sources such as ox blood, mineral or earth pigments range from hematite, red ochre, to kaolin, white china clay, staining their surroundings with iron. Calibiate springs were often endowed with spiritual significance. The river Umber runs through the long, narrow valley inhabited by Coom Martin in Devon. Here until the 1880s, rotted Devonian limestone was quarried for pigments rich in iron and manganese to produce umber and deep brown burnt umber. Clay full of carbon from the nearby Culm measures was used to produce Biddeford black for cheap blacking paint. 
In the Forest of Dean, Gloucestershire, free miners still search out ochre pigments in the Clearwell Caves among the iron ores as they have for more than 7,000 years. Just let that sink in. Red ochre seems to have been in demand for ancient ritual purposes, but a panoply of colours from yellow and orange to red and brown and rare purple, or as they say in Mary Pot, purple, uh, continues to be mined by hand for use in natural and allergy-free paints. That's nice, isn't it? It's allergy-free. In the Mendips in Somerset, remnants of pits last dug in the 1950s for ochre, iron and lead can be found on Banwell Hill and Sanford Hill. Reddle, Raddle or Ruddle, Red iron oxide mixed with clay enabled millers to test their millstones for even grinding. Shepherds still use dye to mark their sheep and to follow the progress of the ram in serving the ewes. A small bag of dye is strapped to his chest, leaving telltale colour on their behinds. I knew that. You see it all over. Not this time of year, but you see all these. And, and, and depending on the colour, it depends which ram. I don't think they put the number of rams in. Sometimes they do, actually. Um, I don't know much about rams, or tups, or tips, as they call them here. Um, anyway, this is what Thomas Hardy needs, says about this in The Return of the Native. Reddell spreads its lively hues over everything it lights on, and stamps unmistakably as with the mark of Cain any person who has handled it in half an, half an hour. Reddell men of the old school are now but seldom seen. I've never seen one. Since the introduction of railways, Wessex farmers have managed to do without these Mephistophelian visitants and the bright, bright pigment so largely used by shepherds in preparing sheep for the fair is obtained by other routes. Even those who yet survive are losing the poetry of existence which characterised them when the pursuit of the trade meant periodical journeys to the pit whence the material was dug, a regular camping out from month to month except in the depth of winter. Field names recall such activities. Riddle Pot in Kendal, Westmoreland. Raddle Pit in Braithwell. Riddle Pit in Hepworth. Ochre Hole in Fixby and Far Oakers in Napton, all in Yorkshire. Ochre Mead in Chigwell, St James, Essex. Ochre Ground in Forest Hill, Oxfordshire. And Raddling in Wootton, Surrey. Mineral lime and water has given us white farmhouses and villages and cities too. They are widespread though sadly now coated with unsympathetic white paints that require less frequent renewal. Umber, ochre and other pigments were sometimes added to lime wash to become part of the local scene. Cambridge whites and Kentish reds had their place. Cornwall and Devon used whites and pinks. Essex, Hertfordshire and Suffolk are, d are distinguished by their plastered and pargeted buildings in a range of colours. Suffolk pink used to be derived from a robust red ochre, now it tends to a pale wash. Colours have drifted over time. In Dedham Vale on the Essex-Suffolk border, the magenta pinks and blues and brilliant whites instead of gentle whitewash are considered less harmonious by conservationists than locally derived natural pigments. Yeah, that was good, wasn't it? I once, uh, not that long ago, stopped in Appleby in Westmoreland, and uh, it's a nice little town. And um, there's a shop there, and this guy is an art shop. And I have a funny thing with art shops because I have no skill at all, although it is in my genetic line. My grandfather was a, a, um, a very talented, uh, my Edinburgh grandfather was a very talented uh, artist. My daughter is an artist, and my cousin Seth is a graphic designer. So the, it is in the family, but I don't have it. Uh, but I still like to go in art shops. So this particular one has all the art things. I love pens. I remember when we were in um, Providence, Rhode Island, there's a great, because there's a big art college there, um, and there's a great art shop there, which I bought some pencils and a great pencil sharpener. And Imogen, my arty daughter, bought a lot of stuff, which we then had to carry with us back across the Atlantic, which, you know, probably was, was, was a worthy sacrifice. Rhode Island's got the Rhode Island School of Design RISD, which is, is very noticeable when you're in the city, and a good thing. So, natural pigments. You've got to love them, I think. Now, of course, we mustn't conflate the natural with the wholly beneficial. People do this, of course. They go like, when I'm at work, I'm not going to take that tablet, but I will take um, the essence of um, hornbeam and uh, bee's leg, which my witchy auntie makes because it's natural people go i'll take this is natural natural as i say many times strychnine is natural cyanide 
is natural. Um, rattlesnake venom is natural. You know, sulfuric acid is natural. So it doesn't mean natural doesn't mean good. So you'd be careful what you take there. I don't know how I got into that. It's about uh, about natural being good. Yeah, natural pigments. That's the point, isn't it? Natural pigments. I kind of feel must be an unalloyed good. Anyway, we're getting close to legend of the week. I think it was custom of the day, I forget. And do you know what? I feel that I have neglected Ireland and I don't like to do that um, because I'm, I, I, have a, I love Ireland and um, I wouldn't want people to think, or the Irish people to think I don't rate them very highly because I do. Anyway, I'm going to say something about, um, this is from a book, oh, you wouldn't believe it, by Miranda Aldhouse Green, who I think used to be Miranda Green, um, unless it's a massive coincidence and there's a Miranda Green and a, and a Miranda Aldhouse Green who both write about Celtic religion, but I suspect it's uh, she's got married or something. Uh, or ch just change her name, she doesn't have to get married, I'm not saying you have to get married to change your name. Sheila changed her name, you know. Um, she changed her name by deed poll into something completely... Why? I don't know. But, um, but not not since I knew her years ago. Anyway, the Irish pantheon. This is from the Book of Invasions, the Leor Gaula Erin, which is um, a book, a big old old book about the, the the Book of the Takings of Ireland. All the different people who came and conquered it, up until you know uh, the medieval period. Here we go. A couple of thousand years ago, there lived in Ireland a people who were gods and the children of gods. They were of radiant beauty and godlike bearing. and They loved, above all things, poetry, music and beauty of form in man and woman. These beautiful people were descended from the goddess Dana and so were called the Dandanans or the people of Dana. Or in Irish, the Tua Je Danan, the tribe of the goddess Dana. In Welsh, she's Dawn, and there's a river called Dawn and Don, and it's a she's a great mother goddess. We don't know very much about her, really. Despite the wide range of divinities present in the mythic stories, there was no clear sky father god in the Irish stories like Zeus or Jupiter in the classical pantheons, although Lu, Clay in Welsh, as a god of light, and Lugos in Gaul, in Roman times, amongst the Celtic Gauls, comes closest to a celestial deity, and the Darda, the good god, was lord of all the gods. There was no single war god like Ares and Mars, but a number of war deities, most of them female. There was no overt goddess of erotic love on the model of Aphrodite Venus, but many goddesses, such as the Morrigan, the great queen, and the queen goddess Maeve, who, or Maeve, they call it these days, but in old Irish, Maeve, related to Medu, drunk, a mead Maeve. Okay had their promiscuous side. I want to say something about the talismans of the Toha Jedanon. Whence the Toha Jedanon came is not recorded in the written myths, but they traced their ancestry, said that funny, to a founder goddess, Danu. When they arrived in Ireland, they brought four precious, magical and powerful objects with them. One, the Stone of Fall, was linked to sacral kingship. When a new ruler was being vetted for election, the stone would shriek if touched by the rightful claimant. Of course, the Stone of Scone, which is at, kept at Dunkeld Abbey, I think, and was recently when King Charles III of England or Britain was um, uh, thrown, they took it down from Scotland. And that was taken over by the Irish uh, immigrants, the Irish um, colonists, col the colonialisers who took over Scotland. Um, and uh, they took that with them, not the, st the Stone of Fall, but a different one. They obviously had one or two, maybe a spare. Uh, the, uh, the, anyway, that's the Stone of Fall. The other three were all connected with individual gods and served to empower them. The cauldron of regeneration belonged to the Darda, the good god, and was never empty of food. The spear of Lu ensured that this warrior god would always prevail over his enemies, and the, store, the sword of Nua, the, well, you know, Nua in um, modern Irish, I think, um, Neath in Welsh. Um, they all had their equivalents in, in the Welsh pantheon as well. Whether that was uh, represents an ancient Celtic set of gods or ones that just became popular because Wales and Ireland are very close across the water. So we don't know. And we don't, I mean, but Lu, or Lugos, was worshipped all over the Celtic world. Leiden, I think, in, um, right, in Belgium and Germany and France. Lyon um, is, is related to him. It was one of his places. So 
and right up into Scotland. You know, he was very, in Ireland, obviously, he was very heavily worshipped. And his festival is Lunasa um, in Irish, um, which it was the festival of the god Lu, which is a harvest festival on the 1st of August. Um, so um, Dancing at Lunasa by Brian Free was a play. Anyway, let's get back to the gods. There were powerful fertility gods, including the Dagda, goddesses associated with sovereignty and prosperity, such as Eru, who is that gives the name to Ireland. And another sacred name for Ireland is Fall. So you get like Fianna Fáil, the warriors of Fáil, um, who is a political party now. Uh, and a, a cluster of functional deities such as Dian Kecht, who combined the roles of healer and craftsman, and Govnu, the smith, whose weapons never missed their mark. This last god, like many of the others, had an otherworld hostel. Those who partook of his feast acquired immortality. You can go and stay there. Only if you go to the other world, though. There is no doubt that the redaction of Irish myths by Christian clerics had a huge influence on the way the Irish pantheon was represented. War deities were evil women with unbridled sexual appetites, and even the Darda was portrayed as a ridiculously bloated and bibulous figure. It means he drinks a bit. Um, I'm just going to say something. Should I say something about... Yeah, I'll, and we'll do a bit more about the Irish gods. Um, the divine triad, triad. Like, do you know the, the Hindus have a, a triad, a Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva? The Irish had one as well. Uh, the, and Dagda, Born and Angus. So there was over Eru a famous king from the Toha Jedanan, and Echo Olahar, the All-Father, was his name. Another name for him was the Dagda for it was he who performed miracles and saw to the weather and the harvest, and that is why he was called the good god. The Dagda was the tribal father god, and his previous deity and principal deity of the pantheon, his title, the good god, indicates his primary role as guardian of Ireland's prosperity. Not only did he possess his magical cauldron of plenty, but he also wielded a huge club, one end of which dealt death, and the other restored life. That's like the pharmacon, isn't it, in, which is an alchemical al 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 thing which is both poison and healing. The Dagda was huge in all senses. His body was enormous and his belly immense. His sexual appetite was prodigious, and he had intercourse with many divine women, including the Morrigan, the great queen. Similarly, his antithesis in her destructive powers and Boan, the river goddess, the boy. His union with the latter took place while she was still married to the water god Nechtan. You know, you may think it um, weird that a, a, a river... Is so important, but think of the Ganges, you know, and so rivers were clearly were heavily worshipped, you know. Uh, when um, Bowen became pregnant by her lover, the couple sought to conceal their illicit partnership, and the Dagda did this by casting a spell on the sun so that it stood motionless in the heavens for nine months, neither rising nor setting. So the baby was effectively conceived and born on the same day. The child was a boy, and they named him Angus MacOg son of the young or the youth, in recognition of the weird solar events surrounding his birth. Angus became a god, Angus, uh, uh, of love, a champion of young, star-crossed couples. I'm not one of them. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit more. Nuadhu of the Silver Arm. Nuadhu Argid Law, the Silver Arm, was once the king of the Tua Jedanan, but there was a strict rule in Irish mythic law that the king had to be physically perfect, with no blemishes or abnormalities. Nuadhu's arm was hacked off in battle, and so, no longer whole, he had to abdicate. But another god, Dian Kecht, came to his aid. He was a divine physician skilled in the craft of healing, but he also had power as a metalsmith. He made Nuadhu a new arm and hand out of the silver, should say no other arrogant law arrogant is silver law is hand he in welsh is neith llaw eraint so llaw is the same as law hand and eraint is the welsh for arrogant silver okay archant in breton no other was uh, um, what is it in cornish Archiam. I can't remember. Something, I think it retains the hurt as well. Um, anyway, thus he made him a new arm, basically. Thus restored to his full form, Nuadhu was able to reassume his kingship. However, he had become exhausted by constant fighting with the Fomorians, monsters who were sworn enemies of the Tua Jedanan. And soon after his new limb had been fitted, he relinquished the leadership of the gods to another much younger god, Lu. 
The name Nuavu may mean cloud maker, hinting at his original function as a god of weather and storms, like the classical Zeus Jupiter. Nuavu, Nuavu and Nodens. It is not often possible to make direct connections between the gods of medieval Celtic myth and the early native divinities worshipped in Roman Britain, but a promising candidate for such associations is a British god, Nodens, whose principal sanctuary was at Lydney. And that means um, that he was also known as, um, I've got to say, Nodens became Neath or Nud. And or he was also known as Lud, Lud, Nud. He, got, he was called both, you know. Llithau um, Arant, so you got Neath Llau Arant, and it, it became Llith Llau Arant, or, you know, so anyway, Ludney means Lud's Island, or Nud's Island, Nud is Nodens, is Nuadu, he's the same dude. Um, anyway, on the Forest of Dean, overlooking the Broad River Seven, close to its est estuary, we nearly went there, but my car broke down. Oh, actually, my catalytic converter was stolen, um, so I never got there. Nodens name is cognate with that of Nuadu, and both may have been cloud makers, lords of the sky and weather. The temple at Lydney was built in the mid fourth century A.D. when Christianity had already become established as a state religion of the Roman Empire. The shrine was excavated in the 1920s by some Ottoman wheeler who found inscriptions indicating that the shrine was dedicated to Nodens. The finds from the temple reveal that Nodens was a hunter-healer deity. Among the votive offerings were nine figurines of dogs, the most splendid being a model of a young deer hound. The great country house at Lydney still has a deer park in its gardens. A mosaic that once glorified the interior of the sanctuary bears an inscription telling of the presence there of an interpreter of dreams presumably those experienced by sick pilgrims as they slept in the sacred dormitory, hoping for a curative vision of the god. There was a bathhouse there, and sick and injured devotees would bathe in an iron-rich spring water in the hope that they would be healed by its touch. The temple at Lydney was situated in deep ancient woodland, high up with an uninterrupted view of the seven and its dramatic tidal bore, as they call it. It's this big tide, which sweeps down. it. It's a big wave, I think, at certain tides. I've never seen it. If Nodens, like Nuadu, was a weather god, his priest may well have claimed the power to predict the boar as Nodens' divine action. The last one I'm going to read you is about uh, Lu of the Long Arm. Uh, Lu Lawada, Long Arm, yeah. At the time when Nuadu felt his power failing, a young man, Lu, whose name means shining one, is related to Lux. Lugos is the older version, which you still see in Gaul. Lux in Latin, the light, yeah appeared at the royal court of Tara and asked for admittance. The doorkeeper demanded to know what special skill the visitor possessed, since nobody without one was allowed to enter the court. Lou replied that he was a carpenter, but the doorkeeper said, already got one. So he said he was a smith. The doorkeeper says, already got one. Then a harper, got one. A hero, got one. A praise poet, got one. A sorcerer, got two. A doctor, got one. A cupbearer, got a couple of those. And a craftsman take your pick. When the guardian of the gate told him that Tara already had at least one of each, Lou reported that his special gifts lay in his ability with all of these skills. He was he got them all, you see. He was permitted to access to the court and to the king. Soon he replaced Nuadu as the king of the gods, using his multiple skills to lead his divine people. So that is the Lou, Law Ada, and we've talked about uh, Nuadu Argad Law, uh, the Dagda, the good god, um, Angus, the healer, Morrigan, Maeve, Queen of Connacht, as she was. As I say, so some of those, some of those are related because, of course, um, as I say, no other becomes Neath of the Silver Hand uh, in Welsh myth, and um, we have uh, uh, Lou is Clay Llaugafes of the Swift Hand. In Welsh rather than the long hand probably means the same thing and uh, you know there's a whole whole load of those like that there we are I'm gonna I'm gonna move slowly I'm just wondering if I've been overstimulating you with all of this because really it's getting late you need to be asleep so I might need to just um, slow it down what I've got planned for the, the remainder of this episode is I'm going to do one of my own stories that I've just done. Do read one of my own stories that I've just written. Just, you can use do for everything, can't you? But it's not precise. So I'm going to read you 
I'm, I'm, it's a longish story, so I'll probably only get the first chapter or two in. And then we might just finish off with a little bit of sweet, sweet, sweet poetry and then drift off on the waves into the darkness. Da, da, da. The wind was up there. I don't know if you heard that. It wasn't me or the dogs. The dog, um, actually, they were fine last night, but they were doing a bit of choir practice the night before. Uh, and um, Ruby, it, she's the girl dog. She's got a very high, she's only small. She's this <laughs> noise. And then Jasper, who's the boy dog, who's her brother, he goes, oh, oh, oh. So they were on at that. I don't know what, I think it was, we had thunder and lightning, you know. And I think it, it, they didn't like it. And so they were, um, they're only six months old. So they were at their gate. Um, we don't crate them um, now. My daughter has got a little Cosmo who came to visit. And the three dogs had a lovely time. And they played very well. And I was very pleased with them for all behaving nicely with each other. Um, a rough and tumble, but, you know, no bad temper or aggression. So it was very sweet. Uh, and the three of them were just, you know, three puppies. And anyway, so we, the, so my daughter does create hers, um, and he quite likes it. He goes in for his, he knows he gets a treat when he goes in. So she was saying sometimes he goes in and he sits there because it's like, yeah, I want a treat, and he gets a treat, and uh, it, you know, so that that's a that's a good thing, isn't it? Anyway, I'm going to go and check on them because I can't hear anything, so they may well be asleep. But I'm going to tiptoe down and see them, get a glass of, I might get a cup of tea. Oh, I think I made a cup of tea and I haven't drunk it. Uh, and uh, I'll go and microwave that. You may not approve of that, but uh, uh, it saves boiling the kettle again. And uh, my, bathe my poor throat, and then I'll come back and read your story. The Poisoned Rose by Tony Walker 1. The big house stood back from the minor road. It had been hard to find, and Edward was glad he had the benefit of the taxi driver's local knowledge. Not that the man knew Hackthwaite Hall itself, but he was familiar with the general area, which was more than Edward was. Edward had got a taxi from Knaresborough, as it was nearly ten miles to Hackthwaite from the station, and a walk would have been a hard one in this frost, still unthawed by the early winter sun. Edward saw the sign on the gatepost that read Hackthwaite Hall, in here, yes, I think. Diffident as ever, Edward's voice was quiet, and the taxi driver struggled to hear him. Beg your pardon, sir. H here? Yes, oh, blind. He says Hackthwaite on the pillar there. The man pointed over his steering wheel. Edward was rather taken aback by the man's tone, but then he remembered that Yorkshiremen were famous for being brusque, so it was probably a joke. The entrance to Hackthwaite Hall was like a photograph that draws your eye in. The twin entrance pillars topped with stone flowers, a rose on the left and a lily on the right, and then a long gravel drive swallowed by trees leading to the house itself, which was invisible from the road. The car turned and entered the drive, and the sound changed as the wheels crunched over the gravel. Edward mused, I always think Ivy is unfairly treated. Sorry, sir, the driver said, not looking back. In the song, uh, The Holly and the Ivy, the song's named after both plants, but it's the holly that gets all the praise. As you say, sir, I never thought of it like that. I mean, all the pricking thorn, the blood of Jesus, the crown. Yes, sir. But I suppose the scarlet berries of the holly are more uh, resplendent than the green ones of the ivy. Even so, I prefer the ivy, I think. It's more discreet. There it is, sir. The driver lifted his left hand from the wheel and indicated the house, his gloved finger like an arrow. And so Edward Smith first saw Hackthwaite Hall. He remembered his reading about it in the Victoria County history of Yorkshire. Original Tudor Manor House, much remodelled in Jacobean times to its current look. Parapets, intricate stonework, featured windows to make it like an antique piece of art, or a cake of sculptured stone. Right-hand side features ill-judged Victorian accretion, but otherwise the place is symmetrical. As they neared the hall, Edward thought the central porch looked like a mouth with its stone wings on either side like enfolding arms. Shepherd's warning, the driver said. Uh, sorry? It had been dark when they set off from Nesborough Station, and now it was light. 
The sun, not visible, blocked by the stone of the house, had risen, and though the orb itself was out of sight, its rising had coloured the air with the vibrant red of a poppy in June. It was an unhealthy glow, Edward thought, like a furnace at work out of sight or blood spilled in the dawn. Of course, the colour meant nothing. Colours were just themselves. White was white, red was red, yellow was yellow. They had no meaning beyond their hue. The car passed the large pond in front of the house, where water was hardened to ice. The dawn silhouettes of ducks wandered grumpily across it. The trees around stood mournful and bare. They drove further down the path to the turning circle in front of the porch with its great oaken door. A stone fountain, lichen-etched, ivy leaves hoar-frosted with white, stood silent in the centre of the gravel circle around which the taxi driver turned. The driver brought the car to an expert smooth stop. And here we are, sir. The driver named his price and Edward fumbled with his wallet, not finding it at first in the depths of his pocket then giving the man the fare and a tip calculated as close to 12% as his change would allow. Thank you kindly, sir. I'll get your bags. I, I don't have much. No, indeed you don't, sir. How long are you planning on staying? The man passed out of earshot on the other side of the car, so Edward got out, his brown brogues crunching on the gravel. The sharp pebbles flecked with moss pricked through the thin city street soles of his shoes. He waited until the driver was close enough, Edward's bag in his hand, and then replied to the question. Um, uh, not sure. A, a week or two, I suppose. The driver glanced at the closed oak door. Nobody's come. You want me to wait? Edward wondered if the driver thought there was no one in, and he would have to take Edward back to Nesborough with him. Edward laughed. No, no, I, I am expected. It's no trouble. It's a long walk back, especially on such a cold and frosty morning. Very seasonal, though. Edward thought that the weather wouldn't actually make the walk any further, but he guessed the man meant that it would seem further, because it was cold. He said, Very kind, but I, I shall be fine, I assure you. Very well, then. I wish you good luck, and uh, thanks for the tip. So Edward Smith waited for the taxi to start, because he believed it was simply good manners, and he watched it drive away past the frozen pond with its ring of winter trees, away down the long drive, out of the gateway, with its guardian lily and sentinel rose. He felt once might not be heard and three times might be rude, so he lifted the heavy iron ring of the door knocker and brought it down twice on the massive door. Then he waited. Two. The heavy thump of the iron door knocker was devoid of any echo, as if the hall beyond was solid, with no room for the sound to escape into. Minutes went by, Perhaps twice hadn't been enough. Edward thought of knocking again, but he didn't. They were expecting him, though perhaps not as early as this. He didn't want to put them out, so if they didn't answer, he supposed he could go for a walk and come back later. He pulled up the collar of his overcoat in anticipation of a chilly stroll to kill time. Then, without any warning via the sound of footsteps or a shouted greeting, the door opened inwards. Edward backed off the top step and then the second until he stood on the gravel. He knew it was impolite to stand on someone's step. The man who opened the door there didn't seem surprised to see him, despite it not even being 9am. Edward said, Sorry to be so early. I caught the milk train from York to Nairsborough. It was either that or, or trying to sleep in York Station waiting room, so I thought I'd make a start. I hope you don't mind. The other was a man in his mid to late fifties, his hair longer than current fashion, his suit brown and pressed of good quality cloth but not flamboyant. His tie was narrow and also brown. The man had a trimmed goatee beard flecked with grey, and his temples were touched with the same colour, but his brown eyes appeared youthful. There was something eager in them. Mr. Smith, he said, how lovely to make your acquaintance at last. After all our letters, I almost felt I knew you, but now I have a face to put to the handwriting. Pleased to be here, Dr. Lovegrove, and, and thank you for your invitation. Lovegrove stepped back and gestured with his arms like a magician inviting a theatre-goer on stage to take part in some dishonest conjuring trick. Come in, come in, it's cold out this morning. Trying to be positive, Edward said, at least there's no more snow. No, that would have made your journey harder. How, how was it in any case? 
Not too bad. I, I came up from Cambridge yesterday and stayed in York last night. I had business with Andrew Ferguson. Uh, do you know him? Uh, I'm, I'm afraid not. He works at the Minster Library. As they spoke, Lovegrove gestured again in welcome, and Edward stepped over the threshold of Hackthwaite Hall, gripping his paltry, battered suitcase. Lovegrove closed the door behind them. The winter was shut out, but the stone-flagged hall was still cold. The place did not appear to be heated. Welcome to Hackthwaite, Lovegrove said. I hope you enjoy your stay for as long as you are with us, and I hope you stay with us as long as it is pleasurable. I'm sure I shall. I'm keen as mustard to get cracking with your collection. Pa, the library can wait. A man needs sustenance first. Have you eaten breakfast? No, it was too early at Knaresborough. Nothing was open, but uh, don't worry. I do worry. I can't let my new cataloguer perish before he starts. I shall ring to ask Mrs Edmondson to lay on an extra setting for breakfast. We weren't expecting you so early, but well, we always have plenty in. I'm sorry if I've put Mrs Edmondson out. Don't worry, she loves to feed visitors. We get so few. Come through to the dining room. Uh, there's coffee on the table. You'll be pleased that I haven't drunk it all yet. Uh, oh, no, it's, it's your coffee. I don't mind if you've drunk it. Well, I haven't. Uh, follow me. Antique statuary lined the back wall of the entrance hall with aspidistras and other plants in large terracotta pots standing here and there on the brown and tan tiles. There were doors to the left and right of the hall and directly ahead of them was a big wooden staircase that rose to a landing and alongside the stairs, to the right, was another corridor that branched off into the hall itself. Dr Lovegrove had already walked over to the door that led deeper into the house and stood waiting. Edward took a minute to orientate himself. Behind him was the large front door of oak, reinforced with black-painted iron studs and bars, probably Jacobean. On either side of the large door were mullioned windows that let in sufficient daylight so that artificial lighting was not needed, though the room remained gloomy. Edward saw electric lights on the walls and a large chandelier, also converted to electricity, hung in the centre. He was not much of an expert on wiring, but the light switches and wiring looked to date from the 1930s. Chop, chop, come through, Lovegrove said. Oh, of course, sorry, I was just admiring your entrance hall. Glad you like it. Lovegrove took him along the passage to the right of the staircase and opened the first door on the right. This led into the dining room, set for breakfast. There were two settings, both pristine, with linen and silver cutlery. In the middle of the table was a silver bowl with white sugar lumps and silver tongs, a glass jar of Seville marmalade, a butter dish and a silver jug containing milk. There were two porcelain coffee cups. Lovegrove said, You sit in Susanna's place. She won't be up for hours and the girl can bring fresh cutlery for her when she does get up. Lovegrove walked to the wall and yanked a bell pull. Still works, despite the age of the house, he said. Edward heard a bell tinkle far away in the depths of the house. He sat at Susanna's chair. He guessed she was Lovegrove's wife, or his daughter, or perhaps just a female friend. He was embarrassed to ask, but wondered whether he should. Lovegrove sat down opposite him. A minute later, a middle-aged woman, dressed in an unfussy blue dress with an apron indicating that she was probably the housekeeper, opened the door. As she came in, Lovegrove said, "'Good morning, Mrs Edmondson. This is our guest, Mr Edward Smith of Cambridge University.' He has arrived earlier than anticipated. I hope that doesn't inconvenience you. Not at all, Doctor. You know we're ready at Hackthwaite for any eventuality. Mind you, it's a good job he did get here early. I just saw out of the kitchen window that it started to snow again, and the wireless says it's forecast heavy. Lovegrove beamed at Edward. Luck is with you, Mr Smith. This is Mrs Edmondson, a very good cook. Bacon, eggs, toast, coffee suit you? Mrs Edmondson added. The eggs are our own. We can offer bacon and sausages, both local from Flets at Hackthwaite Village. Butter and milk are from Mr Harrison at Low Rig. Even the breads only come from the baker at Burton Leonard. Sometimes we bake, but not this week, due to us being busier than usual. Sounds splendid, Edward said. You'll be ready in twenty minutes. In the meantime, do you need more coffee? Lovegrove said. A fresh pot would be lovely. I'll send Ruby with it presently. When she had gone, Edward said, how many servants do you have here? Two at the moment. We'll get you fixed up with breakfast, then show you to your room to leave your things and give yourself a quick wash, and then I hope you don't mind my getting straight to it. I thought of nothing else since we agreed you would come. Of course, 
I'm as excited as you are, Dr. Lovegrove. What a collection! Lovegrove said, I've only been at Hackthwaite since just after the war. Before I came back to the UK in the 30s, I was in Hong Kong, but of course, I've been collecting for many years. I've amassed quite a few, including rare volumes. I was lucky to get Ripley's collection in 1929, which is the core of what I have, and it's never been catalogued. No, not as a collection per se. It's a dreadful mess. I'm afraid that I do not have a tidy mind, Mr. Smith. I know where the books are that I want, but I'm older now and won't be here forever, so I wanted them shipshape. Susanna can decide what she wants to do with them when I'm gone, either keep them or sell them, though she does have quite an interest in the same kind of uh, esoteric matters as I do. Well, uh, women are on the up and up, Edward said. These are egalitarian days, Dr. Lovegrove. Harold, please, though, not Harry, if you don't mind. A slim young girl. Blonde haired, rather pretty, about eighteen years old, came in with a pot of coffee. She put it down on the middle of the table and left without raising her eyes or speaking more than a mumble. These young girls are so shy, Lovegrove said, though she usually manages more words than that. I fear she may have been put off by your sudden appearance. Oh, I I'm sorry. Lovegrove waved away his concern. She's a good girl, just a little shy, and in awe of people from outside her limited rural circle. Uh, coffee? Edward took his without milk. Raising the thin rim of the delicate cup to his lips, he sipped and said, Yes, I'm looking forward in particular to the alchemical books. I think I said I had a special interest. My doctorate, not yet awarded, but awaited, was a review of Richard's Lewitt's work, most especially manuscript GG 1.8, which has some very interesting alchemical entries reminiscent of Nazari. Lovegrove said, I am familiar with Nazari, of course. And it was the subject of your doctorate that caused me to seek you out. You were recommended by a friend of mine at Keys. Oh, who? Lovegrove gave a thin smile. Ah, that would be indiscreet. Uh, oh, sorry, of course. By the way, how much time can you spare us? Well, it's three weeks to Christmas. I was hoping to have it wrapped up by the 23rd and travel home on Christmas Eve. I hope that's possible. At that moment the door opened and Edward Smith beheld the most beautiful young woman he had ever seen. She stood in the doorway, her fair skin giving off a light glow, her face painted with subtle pinks. Her gorgeous red hair fell in soft waves around her face, framing it perfectly. Her eyes were like precious emeralds that glittered from the inside, making it impossible not to look at her. And her lips, which were a soft shade of pale pink, were slightly parted as if she were about to smile. Susanna, you're up early. I heard something, Father, and I guessed our visitor had arrived, so I came down to see if he had. Smith stood. He blushed bright red. Lovegrove gestured. Mr. Smith, meet my daughter Susanna, the rose that adorns Hackthwaite Hall. Susanna walked gracefully to the table and sat. She did not offer to shake hands, which Edward was rather grateful for, as his hand had become clammy at her appearance. Seated, she smiled at him, clear-eyed, intelligent, and warm. Edward sat down after Susanna, shifting his chair slightly away from her. He scanned the table, seeing four chairs positioned around it, but only two place settings. I I'm afraid I've taken your seat, Edward said. Resting her chin upon the back of her hand, Susanna reassured him. Don't fret. Mrs. Edmondson will see to it that I'm well cared for. Besides, losing my seat is a minor price to pay for the pleasure of meeting a new person. Her eyes drifted to the window. And it seems you may be here for a while. The snow appears to be coming down heavily. 3. It was shy young Ruby Mumberson that got the job of showing Edward Smith to the bedroom on the first floor where he would stay while at Hackthwaite Hall. She took him back to the entrance hall and up the broad oak staircase. The stairs rose straight up from the entrance hall to a landing. When they arrived at the first landing, the window showed a sky full of falling snow. On either side of the landing, further rises of four step led off to the wings. Ruby indicated for them to go left. Do you live in? Smith said, following her. In the hall, yes, sir. Both Mrs. Edmondson and me live here. I wager you're glad you don't have to walk home through all that after finishing work tonight. Yes, sir. Edward always found it easier to talk to people who were younger than him and those that might be considered by less progressive people than he as his social inferiors. He felt ordinary working people didn't expect things from him, and that made him more comfortable. 
She saw him glance at the falling snow. Doesn't look like it's going to stop soon, Ruby said. After that, she said barely anything, leaving them walking in awkward silence as they went up the stairs and along the landing until they arrived at the door of the room where Edward was to lodge. As they'd walked saying nothing more, Edward revised his opinion and considered perhaps it wasn't as easy as he'd thought to converse with country people. This is the blue room, sir, Ruby said, opening the door with an outstretched arm. Smith stepped inside, meagre case in hand. Powder blue curtains patterned after a William Morris design with cheerful yellow blossoms hung at the window of Edward Smith's new bedroom. An antique four-poster bed draped in coordinating blue fabric stood at the centre of the room. At its feet lay an ornate oriental rug with azure and cerulean hues depicting a blue sky and blue fountains contrasting with a mass of crimson and carmine roses that together portrayed a sultan's perfumed garden. Bokhara, Smith said. Sorry, sir. The carpet. Just wondering where it was from. Ruby looked baffled. Harrogate, maybe. Well, it's lovely. The quilt on the bed was also blue. The water jug and basin for washing were Chinese willow pattern blue, of course. Edward thought uh, there was rather a lot of blue. It could give a chap a headache. The bathroom's down the hall. Will that be all, sir? He looked at Ruby. She really was quite pretty in a village girl kind of way. Wavy blonde hair, blue eyes that matched the room, a hint of red flushing her cheeks, though that might be from shyness as much as her natural colour. He supposed she was of Danish stock. Many of these Yorkshire Dales folk were. I think that's it. Uh, Dr. Lovegrove said to meet him in the library, didn't he, as we were going out? Yes, sir. Trouble is, I don't know where that is. Do you want me to wait to show you, sir? She still hadn't met his eyes. He said, no, I I'm sure you're very busy. I just need to wash my hands and face after the journey. If you tell me where it is, I I'm sure to find it. Very well, sir, but the library's on the third floor at the end of the East Wing Corridor. Go back to the landing, then up at the opposite passage till you get to the East Stairs. Go up, and that's where it is. Capital. I'm sure I can find that from your splendid directions. Ruby turned to leave. Uh, thank you, by the way. Smith called to her, retreating back. He heard a muffled, You're welcome, sir, as she spoke, not turning round, hurrying away. Edward Smith put his case on the bed, then removed it, wondering if it was bad manners to place one's case on a made bed and concluding it was. He wasn't much used to family ways. His mother and father had sent him home from Ceylon to school, and he'd spent all the terms and most holidays back in the tropics with his family, and then later at Cambridge, living in college with other young men. His mother and father had been rather distant, and he'd had no sisters or female friends, so both families and women were a mystery to him. He'd had to learn the social rules of mixing with others laboriously, rather than having had it taught him by his parents. Edward took off his wire-rimmed spectacles and pulled a white cotton handkerchief from his pocket. He brought the glasses up to his mouth, breathed on them, and then rubbed away the mist. That was better. He could see better now. Then he went to the window. By his reckoning, this window faced the middle of the house, while the one on the other side of the room looked over the pond to the front. The window was a mosaic of small glass diamonds bedded in thick lead piping. He touched the glass, and it was cold to his fingertips. This glass was old and not uniform, some thick and some thinner, with bubbles and infirmities showing it was over a hundred years old or more. Through it, even with his clean spectacles, he could only vaguely see the snow falling, and so he twisted the catch and pushed the window open, letting the frigid air in. He smelled the winter's cold, but stuck his head out anyway and peered down. This window looked out onto an open quadrangle in the centre of the house. In the middle of the quadrangle was a surprisingly sizable garden about the size of a tennis court and full of luxurious greenery. The rest of the house was so neat that Edward would have expected this quadrangle garden to be tidy too, but not a bit of it. Plants grew here in profusion despite the season, and among them wild-looking rose bushes with arms of briar and thorns, and still, even in December, red roses bloomed, heads down, heavy with snow, intoxicated and numbed by its chill touch. Edward shivered and closed the window. 
pressing down the catch hard so the window would not come open again. He thought a wash and brush-up would do him good, so he left his blue room and wandered along the long, wood-panelled corridor until he found the bathroom, three doors after his own, on the opposite side. He presumed the other doors led to other guest rooms. He also presumed they were locked, but he didn't check. After a wash and a comb of his hair, he tried to follow Ruby's directions to the library, but found himself lost. He was sure he was in the correct wing of the building, but these old buildings were so convoluted with accretions added on down the years. Edward remembered seeing the Victorian editions from outside and wondered if that was the part of the building he was in now. He kept on going and found a pleasant-looking room in a tower. There was a stained-glass window of Victorian provenance that showed the front of the hall and the frozen pond with its mournful ducks. It was rather well done for Victorian glass. Through the window he observed that the snow was indeed still falling, and more heavily. There were three or four inches down now, and any marks left by his taxi, made not much more than an hour before, were obliterated beneath it. The odd thought came to him that he had not just arrived, but that he had been here at Hackthwaite forever. But it was such a silly idea that he laughed and left the room and stepped back into the gloomy corridor. He was still lost. The walls of the passage were adorned with landscapes, but they were dismal and lacked any sense of reward or beauty. The oil paintings appeared neglected, as if they needed a thorough cleaning to restore their true essence. It was difficult to determine whether their somberness was intentional or a consequence of neglect. To the left of Edward a door stood slightly ajar, beckoning him with a sliver of light seeping through. It wasn't the entrance to the library, yet Something about the room beyond intrigued him. Perhaps it held a large window, offering a glimpse of the outside world. Curiosity stirred within him, urging him to explore further. And deep down, a part of him longed to witness the snow once more. There was an ethereal quality to the snow, as if it possessed a heavenly power to cleanse and transform. It seemed to bring an end to the old, and herald the arrival of the new, its pristine whiteness shimmering in silence. Again, silly, poetic thoughts, very unlike him. As Edward entered the room, he immediately recognised it as the music room. The space was filled with an air of anticipation, with the chairs arranged as if waiting a grand concert. In the centre stood a majestic grand piano, its presence commanding attention. Driven by curiosity, Edward circled around the piano, drawn to the open lid, revealing the intricate inner workings of the instrument. It was as if the piano itself yearned to be played, its keys awaiting the touch of skilled human hands. On the thin arms of the music stand, a book of sheet music lay open, displaying Schumann's Winterreiser. Edward imagined the soul-stirring music that had filled that room. It was a scene that evoked a sense of both beauty and melancholy, as if the music itself would whisper of emotions and stories yet to be told. Edward could not play the piano, but like everyone who cannot play the piano, when they find one with no one around to hear, they plonk the keys. He reached out and played. The notes rang out singly into the empty room. He didn't know the keys, and though he had had piano lessons at school until they gave up on him, could not read music. Was that a, a C? A? D? He kept trying until he had a run of notes, a pleasant, if stilted, melody. He was quite lost in his playing. Ah, Mr. Smith, you found the music room. Dr. Lovegrove stepped into the room. I'd wondered where you'd got to, but it seems you've been exploring. Edward blushed, his cheeks turning rose red. Oh, I'm so sorry, I, I shouldn't have. I, I was looking for the library, and it got a bit lost. Lovegrove frowned. Did Ruby not wait to show you the way? No, it's not her fault. I told her to go. She gave me good directions, directions I was unfortunately too stupid to follow. I'm so sorry to intrude in your private rooms. I saw the door open, and I thought perhaps this was the right way. You thought it was the right way? Really? But in any case, these rooms are not private. Do not apologise. I, too, am easily diverted by music. Do play. Smith gave a brief laugh. Um, no, as you may have heard. Lovegrove smiled. I thought you might have been warming up. In any case, 
Come and I will show you the library. Well, that was the first part of uh, The Poisoned Rose, my latest novella. I, you know, when you read your own stuff, you think, oh, you see so much wrong with it. And I saw lots wrong with that, but it's too late for me to sit and rewrite it as I'm talking, although I did make, I couldn't help myself. I kept stopping and doing a few errors, correcting a few errors. Um, I wonder if it's not too slow a start. My intention was to just build atmosphere to start and just raise a few questions in your mind. So, like, uh, what's going on? We've got this librarian and we've got uh, this house and this Dr. Lovegrove and his daughter Susanna, who's astonishingly pretty. And then there's young Ruby um, Mumberson, who's the maid. So what is going on? And th those are the kind of questions I want you to ask. What? Why is that that garden Hear yeah, the doves, well, they're waking up. Um, why is that garden flourishing and f blooming? The red rose is blooming in the depths of winter, and it's near the darkest time of the year, so that is, I think, significant as well. The lily and the rose, obviously, the colour red, the theme of the red. Anyway, you shall see, you shall see. Or not, you can all skip over it. It's probably, um, I'm probably about a fifth of the way through there, so... Maybe you know, not quite a quarter. So uh, anyway, we'll we'll keep on going and see how it goes. Right, I was gonna. I'm kind of drawing to a close now, so I wanted to finish with some more. You know, because this is like a whimsical collection of just things that occurred to me. So I'm going to read you some words with from the Prelude. I've done the full Prelude on my classic uh, poetry podcast. This is um. This has particular resonance for me. I know the place. That he's talking about and there's a thing at the end which you may or may not get i'll probably mention it anyway let's go one summer evening i found a little boat tied to a willow tree within a rocky cave its usual home straight i unloosed her chain and stepping in pushed from the shore it was an act of stealth and troubled pleasure not without the voice of mountain echoes did my boat move on leaving behind her still on either side small circles glittering idly in the moon until they melted all into one track of sparkling light. But now, like one who rose, proud of his skill, to reach a chosen point with an unswerving line, I fixed my view upon the summit of a craggy ridge, the horizon's utmost boundary. Far above was nothing but the stars and the grey sky, she was an elfin pinnace, lustily I dipped my oars into the silent lake, and as I rose upon the stroke, my boat went heaving through the water like a swan. When from behind that craggy steep, till then the horizons bound, a huge peak, black and huge as if with voluntary power instinct upreared its head. I struck and struck again, and growing still in stature the grim shape towered up between me and the stars, and still, for so it seemed, with purpose of its own, and measured motion like a living thing, strode after me. With trembling oars I turned and through the silent water stole my way, back to the covert of the willow tree. There, in her mooring place, I left my bark, and through the meadows homeward went, in grave and serious mood, but after I had seen that spectacle, for many days my brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being. O'er oh, my thoughts there hung a darkness, call it solitude or blank desertion. No familiar shapes remained, no pleasant images of trees, of sea or sky, no colours of green fields, but huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men, moved slowly through the mind by day and were a trouble to my dreams. William Wordsworth from The Prelude, Book One. I'll tell you how, one of the reasons that that particular last bit, Huge and Mighty Forms, you may know I, I have um, an association with the Hartwood Institute. I like to think of it as that. And Jonathan Sharp, who, and he did a thing a dandelion radio that had that sampled in it and it, i suppose what it's about is that 
the, the mountains are living things, but huge and mighty, that do not live like living men. That is to say, they're utterly alien. Their mode of being is alien from us, but they're nevertheless um, alive. And, and I often think of that when I'm watching the birds, the jackdaws and the gulls and things like that, and, and the ants going about their business. And that we are nothing to them. We think we're in control. We think we're in control. We think this is ours. It's not ours. It's not ours at all. You know, we are, we are as um, small and insignificant and also as significant as the ants. Anyway, let's this talk about fairies, which we weren't, but uh, this is a, I'm going to come to a near close, not quite. Um, Queen Mab. This is by Shakespeare from Romeo and Juliet, Act 1, Scene 4. Queen Mab. She is the fairy's midwife, and she comes in shape no bigger than an agate stone on the forefinger of an alderman, drawn with a team of little atomies athwart men's noses as they lie asleep, her wagon spokes made of long spinner's legs, the cover of the wings of grasshoppers, her traces of the smallest spider's web, her collars of the moonshine's watery beams, her whip of cricket's bones, the lash of film, her wagoner a small grey-coated gnat, not half so big as a round little worm pricked from the lazy finger of a maid. A chariot is an empty hazelnut, made by the joiner squirrel or old grub, time out of mind the fairies' coachmakers. And in this state she gallops night by night through lovers' brains, and then they dream of love, or courtiers' knees that dream on curtsy straight, O lawyers' fingers who straight dream on fees, O ladies' lips who straight on kisses dream, Which oft the angry mab with blisters plagues Because their breaths with sweetmeats tainted are. Sometimes she gallops o'er a courtier's nose And then dreams he of smelling out a suit, And sometimes comes she with a tithe pig's tail Tickling a parson's nose as he lies asleep. Then dreams he of another benefice, Sometimes she driveth o'er a soldier's neck, and then dreams he of cutting foreign throats, of breeches, ambuscados, Spanish blades, of healths five fathom deep, and then anon drums in his ear, at which he starts and wakes, and being thus frighted swears a prayer or two, and sleeps again. This is that very mab that plats the manes of horses in the night, and bakes the elf-lock in foul sluttish hairs, which once untangled much misfortune bodes. This is she. When we get to this point, I'm tired, and my mind is running on all sorts of things. It's, it's uh, fairly erratic at the best of times, but now, when I'm tired, the thoughts just seem to come like fireflies, flitting around, and I don't know why the coming, but it occurred to me, talking about, I was saying just before I read that, about the, the birds and the ants and the wind, and how it just all goes on. We don't own it. We don't control it. It's not ours to do with as we wish. It does what it wants, and we are in many ways insignificant to its ways, and we'll go, and it will remain, or th other things will remain. But, but uh, uh, one of those fireflies was a quote, and I can't even remember who, said it, and it was something like, um, it is right to honour our ancestors, if only to remind us that we did not create ourselves. And I think that's a very humbling thought, that we should always remember that, that we are not so big. Because that's the problem when you get too big for your boots. Well, pride cometh before a fall. The Night Mail by W. H. Auden. This is a night mail crossing the border, bringing the check and the postal order. Letters for the rich, letters for the poor, the shop at the corner, the girl next door. Pulling up at Beatick, a steady climb, the gradients against her, but she's on time. Past cotton grass and moorland boulder, shoveling white steam over her shoulder, snorting noisily as she passes silent miles of wind bent grasses. Birds turn their heads as she approaches, stare from bushes at her blank-faced coaches. Sheepdogs cannot turn her course, they slumber on with paws across. In the farm she passes no one wakes, but a jug in a bedroom gently shakes. 
dawn freshens, her climb is done, down towards Glasgow she descends, towards the steam tugs yelping down a glade of cranes, towards the fields of apparatus, the furnaces, set on the dark plain like gigantic chessmen. All Scotland waits for her, in dark glens beside pale green lochs, men long for news. Letters of thanks, letters from banks, letters of joy from girl and boy, receipted bills and invitations to inspect new stock or to visit relations, and applications for situations, and timid lovers' declarations, and gossip, gossip from all the nations, news circumstantial, news financial, letters with holiday snaps to enlarge in, letters with faces scrawled on the margin, letters from uncles, cousins and aunts, letters to Scotland from the south of France, letters of condolence to highlands and lowlands, written on paper of every hue, the pink, the violet, the white and the blue, the chatty, the catty, the boring, the adoring, the cold and official and the hearts outpouring, clever, stupid, short and long, the typed and the printed and the spelt all wrong. Thousands are still asleep, dreaming of terrifying monsters, or a friendly tea beside the band in Cranston's or Crawford's, asleep in working Glasgow, asleep in well-set Edinburgh, asleep in granite Aberdeen, they continue their dreams, but shall wake soon and hope for letters, and none will hear the postman's knock without a quickening of the heart, for who can bear to feel himself forgotten? The Hosting of the She by W. B. Yeats The host is riding from Knocknaray, and over the graves of Clutna Bear, Kielche tossing his burning hair, and the knee of calling away, come away, empty your heart of its mortal dream. The winds awaken, the leaves whirl round, our cheeks are pale, our hair is unbound, our breasts are heaving, our eyes are agleam, our arms are waving, our lips are apart, and if any gaze on our rushing band, we come between him and the deed of his hand, we come between him and the hope of his heart. The host is rushing twixt night and day, and where is there hope or deed as fair? Quilcher tossing his burning hair, and Neve calling away, come away. <laughs>